Each season, Guys Telling Stories seeks out fascinating people with a good story to tell. I'm Rich Douglas, and this man beside me is my co-host, Bill Easton. We're a couple guys who love a good story. So join us on our quest as we find fascinating people with a good story to tell. This is Guys Telling Stories. Welcome to the show. Hey, Rich. Bill, great to be here with you. You know, we do that opening, uh, and we kind of just do it, like every time. Every time. We could just record it. I know, but I, I just love being here with you, and I'm thrilled oh. about our guest today. Okay. So It's hard to be quiet when you're talking. You're all serious. <laughs> I try to shut my eyes. Imagine I'm there. Oh, I am there. You are there. You're right You're right beside me, mm-hmm. or right across from me. I'm so. across today. Well, Bill, I'm thrilled about our guest today. He's an entrepreneur, a philanthropist. And he's event organizer of the legendary party and annual fundraiser known as the world's largest disco. Favorite day of the year. One of them, for sure. His name? Dave Petrosky. True story. Bill, how many times have you gone to this event, the world's largest disco? It is very difficult to put an exact number, but I think this is year 20. Year 20 for you. In a row. Like, not missing one. It is always the Saturday after Thanksgiving, Mm -hmm. and this year marks the 25th anniversary the disco turns 25 this year so we missed five years you missed five years i've gone with you for the past i would say at least six or seven yeah it it, time flies man it sure does it sure does uh any fond disco memories before we talk to dave well the outfits have always been uh interesting you know we've we've probably got there uh we've gone to the disco we've we've taken limos we've driven uh we've ubered now yeah. Um, you know, we've, we've stayed in hotels, we've done all kinds of stuff. Um, you know, back when we first started, I would, I was still at West Virginia, so I'd drive up for the whole Thanksgiving thing and, and just kind of go. I think the first year I didn't even dress up. I just didn't really know what was going on. What to expect. Yeah. yeah. So, um, just, yeah, a lot of great memories and, and, uh, a lot of good friends that have gone and, uh, it's cool. Um, and going again. Well, uh, for the listeners at home or uh, listeners who have never been there, this event holds every single year about 7,000 plus people. Mm -hmm. It raises hundreds of thousands of dollars every single year for charity. And for the past 25 years, Dave and his crew of volunteers and sponsors have organized basically an event for the ages called Mm -hmm. the World's Largest Disco. And uh, it's been voted greatest event on earth by a couple of websites. By me. (laughs) <laughs> of course, yeah, you love it. And uh, to date, the event has donated over $5,500,000 to charities. That's amazing. Like Camp Good Days and Special Times, that's a local camp for children with cancer. That's cool. And in uh, prepping for the interview, I realized that it's a 100% volunteer run. So mm-hmm. since its in- inception, no one's ever been paid or reimbursed for any of the expenses. That's cool. And it's a, it's a big year for, for Dave and his crew this year. The disco turns 25, so we're hoping to hear all about how Dave started this event and how it evolved into a massive success that it is today. Yep, and, and don't forget the special guests. Oh, oh yeah, we got to ask him about we gotta that. We got to ask him how... Uh, how do you know, start getting celebrities to show yeah, up every Henry single Winkler year? Henry Winkler has been there at least once. Oh, yeah, oh, um, yeah. Had the Hanson brothers from Slapshot. I remember uh, seeing Lou Ferrigno, Incredible Hulk himself. Phil McCracken from Slap, <laughs> not Phil. <laughs> Phil McCracken. I forget his name. <laughs> yeah, I know who you're talking about. Yeah, so yeah. other Slapshot guys. Oh, yeah, well, Phil. Oh. You know Phil. Yeah, Everyone knows yeah. Phil. Well, it's an amazing event. It's so much fun. It's one of those things people put on their bucket list, I'm sure. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's been happening for 25 years. So why don't you say we uh, pack this stuff up and go talk to Dave? Sounds good. All right, Dave, welcome to the show. Thank you. Very excited to have you here. Uh, we were realizing this is Bill's 20th year and 25th year for you doing the event. That's amazing. I know. I can't imagine even going to the same fireworks show 20 years in a row, <laughs> let alone planning the same uh, same huge event that thousands of people come to. So before we get too far into it, um, can you tell people where's the best place for them to go online to find out more about you, the charity, the event itself? Um, the, the best place to find out about the event is our website. It's, it's uh, worldslargestdisco.com, and uh, you know it'll give you a little history on the event, uh, pictures from probably almost all of the years, mm-hmm. um, the list of celebrities that have appeared, and um, you know who, what, when, where, and why, where to get clothes, transportation, hotels, tickets, everything from uh, from 
you know, where you can go beforehand, where you can stay during that weekend. It's a, it's a great resource. It's where act- you can buy your outfits. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, well, Dave, um, th- a little bit about yourself. You know, where'd you grow up? Uh, you know, what kind of kid were you? Um, you know, was disco popular in your younger days? Uh, I, I guess it was at the end. Um, I'm originally from Cheektowaga. Um, I grew up uh, at Pine Ridge in Genesee, if you're familiar with that area at all. Mm-hmm. And uh, then uh, went to Narden Academy for grammar school. Uh, went to St. Joe's for high school and then went off to Syracuse University. But um, back back when we started the, uh, uh, well, when disco was big, you know, I think you mentioned this before, that uh, in 1979, you know, I was only 16 years old. So uh, I didn't go to the event. I didn't know what the event was. And uh, just kind of by happenstance, we ended up, you know, taking on that name and, and the party. With that original event, it was downtown. Do you recall anything about it, hearing about it? Was it in the news, yeah. friends talking about I, it? I think I knew it existed. I know so much about it now because I did a lot of research when we decided to approach them and ask them to use the name. Um, but, yeah, disco was big in the in the late 70s. And, you know, I was probably a sophomore in high school. So, and the drinking age was 18. So we used to go to bars when we were sophomores in high school, even though we weren't supposed to be there. And all the big nightclubs back in the days, Uncle Sam's, and I mean, these people would have, these places would have 2,000 people in them. And on Sunday nights, when they'd be empty, they'd have a teen night. So even if you were underage, you could go and you could go to the cool club that your parents and your friends, everybody went to, and you'd have the same experience they did, except they didn't serve alcohol. You had that at Mickey Rats when they started, too. Yeah, I remember teen nights. Wow. They, were, they were a lot of fun, but uh, at the drinking age, it, it was not 18. I could imagine, you know, <laughs> if you get underage kids, for example, who are looking to uh, to uh, have a good time, a teen night is probably the, the ideal night. But you said it was Sundays. That's not the best night to go out when you're in high school. But Well, Uncle Sam's would, would have, you know, on a Monday night, would have 1,800 people in it. And there'd be a line to Walden Avenue, you know, uh, that, that would be uh, 45 minutes to get in. And That's if crazy. you added up all the bars today in Buffalo and you put all the people that were in that bar in one room, you wouldn't have 1,800 people. No. no. So it, uh, the experience was, was in Sunday night. That was the only night that they, they weren't going to have a lot of paying customers. So yeah. it was great for kids and it was great for them. Mm. Well, if you take us back to the beginning, speaking of numbers, that original disco, 1979, it had, um, if, if I got the numbers correct, over 13,000 people in attendance, Guinness Book of World Records. Um, I'm just wondering, um, the original event planners didn't do another one. Did you, did you ever talk to them? Like, hey, uh, how come? What's going on with this uh, this record-breaking event? Yeah, it, it, uh, uh, Bob Richter and Larry Rieger um, funded the event in 1979, and basically what they did was they gave the United Way a loan uh, and I think it was $100,000. And they said, we'll, pull up, we'll put up $100,000. We'll help you organize this. And when you pay us back, whatever you make in excess of that, you can keep. So it was really a no-lose situation because if it didn't make money, it was okay. But these guys, like, you know, they were doing big events. The convention center just opened um, not too long before that. And uh, disco was huge. And, you know, Buffalo was, was you know, one of the innovators in, in disco music. And, and, you know, they created the dance floor for Saturday Night Fever. It was made at Light Lab on on Elm Street in Buffalo. So, you know, we had some some history, and we were able to grab, and we were centrally located, so we were near Toronto. Um, we were not far from New York City. They actually had a train that ran from Albany to Buffalo to bring people to the world's largest disco. That's and awesome. people came from all over the world, and they had the top acts. So, you know, uh, Glory Gaynor and the Tramps, they were the, they were the big acts of the time, mm-hmm. and they were here. So, uh, yeah, so they they did it once, and when I called and asked, I said, "Can you know? Can I use the name?" Because I didn't want to get too far into it, or have you know have someone come after me at, because I was using some trademark name. And they're like, "You know, we did it once. We were never going to do it again." And it was a one and done thing. And and I think after disco was done, probably three years later, there was no reason to ever recreate. Right. You know, Yeah, I mean, it took you guys about 15 years to revive the event. I I know uh, in the meantime, historically, kind of a fun fact, Bill, they had uh, Disco Demolition Night in in Chicago in 1979. And literally the same year as that first event, the people were coming to a baseball game and their admission was discounted if they brought in a disco record to be exploded in between the games. I do remember that. And so, you know, flash forward, you know, 15 years or so, um, you and some friends or you and some family, you can kind of tell us the story. How, how'd you decide to start uh, reviving this event and planning it? Well, I was driving around downtown Buffalo in 1993, and uh, Wednesday is the, is, the, uh, is the busiest bar night of the year. 
Um, Thursday, people are with their families. Friday, they're kind of with their families looking for something to do. And on Saturday, people basically have cabin fever. And I said, all of our friends are home from college, and there's nothing going on. I said, next year, I want to have a party. So I, I was driving down uh, Chippewa Street, and there was one bar on Chippewa Street at the time called the Concrete Cafe. And before that, you know, Chippewa Street was a street of drugs and prostitution. It wasn't a very pretty place. Okay. Cool. Um, so I made a left after I drove by the, the Concrete Cafe, made a left down to Delaware, drove by the Statler. The Statler was dark. Drove by the convention center. The convention center was dark. Made another left, and Jim Kelly's network and Sports City Grill were in the process of closing. I said, you know, there's nothing going on here. I'm, I'm going to throw a party. So we needed a theme. We knew what the date was going to be. We just didn't know what the theme was going to be. And the retro thing was big in Boston and L.A. and Chicago and Miami. And it was just, you know, like everything else, fashions and what have you. It makes its way to Buffalo two to three years later. Mm-hmm. So it was just starting to become popular. There was a bar called Fascinations in, uh, in uh, Chictawaga at the corner of the Gardenville Plaza, which is now really not a plaza anymore. But... Uh, they used to have this big retro night on what was Q102 at the time. It's now Star 102. And every Saturday night was this big retro. And they had big crowds. So we, I went to them and asked permission. I said, if I do this, you know, we'll give you some publicity, but we wanted you to kind of stand aside from this promotion so we can do it with the radio station that night. And they agreed to it. And then I called the guy that did the first one, and I said, hey, you know, this is a great theme, and it just happens to be the 15th year. You know, do you mind if I use the name? And he's like, no, go ahead. Was this your first time trying to organize this type of event, or did you run other successful events in the past? Yeah, I, I've always been kind of a, a promoter, so I, I was big into dances when I was at St. Joe's, and we had record numbers. You know, I think when I started there, I took over, we were averaging 1,000 people a dance, and when I left, we were at 2,000 people a dance. And we had some pretty cool things happen. You know, when, uh, when I was at St. Joe's, uh, Talis was on tour with Van Halen. And that was kind of a big deal. This big, you know, this local band who we used to play every place, and people played. You know, back in that in those days, live bands played every night. Mm-hmm. So I mean, you could make a living in a live band, and you'd work six nights a week. I mean, they'd be at this club on Monday, and this club on Tuesday, and this club on Wednesday. So Van Halen went on tour, or uh, Talis went on tour with Van Halen, and they came back. And their first date back in Buffalo was at St. Joe's High School, and we had twenty two hundred kids there. Um, so that's that's kind of where I got my start, and then I did some. Same thing in college, and uh, I just always liked it. Okay. Makes sense. It sounds like a good idea, like a no-brainer. It's the 15-year anniversary, but I'm uh, taking people back to 1994. Uh, Ace of Base, Boys to Men, uh, Salt and Pepper are popular on the radio. <laughs> Did friends look at you and go, why the hell are you throwing a disco party? Or, or they kind of on to that retro scene, too. Well, you know, the first thing we did, it it was, like I said, if you went to weddings and things, they were starting to play 70s music again, Um, just like today, how they play 80s music Mm -hmm. and probably 90s music at events. But, uh, and and we also had this base to build on because we had all these people, it was only 15 years, so it wasn't like it was 30 years later or 40 Mm -hmm. years later, it was 15 years later, and people do like to relive the past. So I started reaching out to some people that DJed in those clubs and said, hey, I want to put this thing together, and, you know, do you know people that would come? And, you know, sometimes they did and sometimes they didn't. So that was 25 years ago was the first, uh, the first one that you, you ran. How yes. many people showed up? Uh, we had 1,500 people. We originally thought we were going to have probably a third of that because we sold all the tickets at the door. Mm-hmm. So there was kind of a buzz brain, you know, building, and we said at the last minute, we're going to throw it upstairs and see what happens. And we took half the floor. And, uh, it, you know, it was, it was great. It was a lot of fun. It was pretty easy. Um, it was really kind of poorly organized uh we had speakers in all four corners like they did at mickey rat or i'm sorry at uncle sam's and uh and what happened was we didn't have a coat check so the entire night what i would end up doing is walking around and taking the coats off the speakers people <laughs> yeah. didn't want to have them on the floor so they just throw them over the speaker well you you, you said it you know, you drove by you drove downtown and looked around and and you know once you give someone something to do on a night when there's nothing to do that can take off quickly. So, and it has for you. That's it, it's a perfect day. It's if anyone's ever going to throw a party that's listening to this, it doesn't have a party in their town. It never changes. It's two days after Thanksgiving. Mm-hmm. Everybody's always off. People are always home who aren't normally home. It, it's it's literally the perfect day to have a party. 
It really is. And um, I'm assuming your family and friends were uh, impressed with that initial success. Did you uh, break the news to them that right away we're doing it again or did you kind of have to let it mellow a little bit? Yeah, we, we knew we were going to do it again. Mm-hmm. Plus, when we first started, you know, we probably had, I don't know, 40 or 50 people. I would just kind of get groups of people and say, hey, you know, if, can you sell five tickets? Can you sell five tickets? And that's really how, you know, people go where people are. Mm-hmm. So if I get you and you have 10 friends and you have 10 friends and all of a sudden now we have 30 people and if that we can multiply that you know it's like i guess it's today's multi-level you know uh, marketing Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah yeah that's that's true actually so that's that's how it originally happened and and you know my friends and family have been volunteering for this thing since the beginning also so that's that's a huge thing because we have a base of people that are familiar with the event that are very dedicated to it and, and you know like helping out well, moving you along for after that first year, um, I know that the story goes that you decided to bring in some celebrity guests like Greg Brady, mm-hmm. Brady Bunch, Isaac from The Love Boat. How difficult was it to like get celebrities to come uh, in the mid-90s to, uh, to a disco party? You know, I think things like Comic-Con and, and celebrity autograph sessions and things, they really didn't exist. Um, and when you're reaching out to these celebrities, you have to find someone that, first of all, people recognize. Number two, it's, it has to be someone who's not really, really popular today. Because, and you've got to yeah. find someone that, that, uh, that, that wants to give up their Thanksgiving to come to Buffalo. So the good news is if they're working in, in, in the entertainment business today, they're probably not working Thanksgiving weekend. The bad news is it's one of the few times they have off. Right. So, and almost all these guys still live in L.A., so they're going to have to come cross country to to be at your event and give up time with their family. So it, it's it's a challenge. Do you think it had an impact on the event directly to to be able to advertise and say we're having these guests every single year? These celebrities that you're going to recognize. Well, it gave some credibility to the event, um, and today it's the number one question. Like, okay, so you know who are the celebrities this year? And you'd think that it's really really important. But the reality is, is that nothing really changes. Mm-hmm. It's going to be the same day. It's going to be in the same building. You know, occasionally we'd get, you know, I've got a laundry list of things that people have complained about over time, and we've tried to really improve the event every year. But I can't invent new hits from the 70s. Like, that's it. <laughs> yeah. well, there's, here's the list. I heard that song last year. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> you play a lot of the same music. I'm like, well, we try to cycle songs in and out. But the reality is, is, do you really remember remember what song someone played a year ago at a wedding? No, Mm-mm. only if it yeah. <laughs> only if it, it doesn't really bad fit. One. Only if it's a really bad. And one. Yeah, we're not playing the bird dance. <laughs> no, and if you don't play the hits, like if I mean, you should probably, I bet you play some of the hits more than once throughout the night because people maybe they are checking their code or they run to the bathroom like oh I missed disco, you know my favorite song and it's like well yeah we actually play that one three times. Yeah, that's that's a mortal sin when you're a DJ is to play the same song mm-hmm. twice. You gotta maybe go if you have if you have the VIP you go downstairs maybe the band will play it Do they haven't played it yet <laughs> then you go back upstairs so, and yeah you might hear it twice but you, I think you hear it in, yeah we don't on different play any songs twice the other thing we've learned is we don't play any extended songs uh, any remix songs because people there want to hear the song the way they remember it on the radio mm-hmm. is it vinyl do you use vinyl or is it oh. we we did use vinyl probably the first seven years but okay. today the quality is so good and and I'm not worried about feedback and the record skipping or somebody walking up the stairs of the stage and gotcha yeah yeah so makes we're, sense we're beyond yes. that be fun to, to see you should just do it anyway just have someone up there pretending to play with the vinyl just <laughs> put it down well <laughs> i can picture it in my mind but also i know that you've continued to evolve the event year after year and uh, on the website it says by year three you were using the entire convention space getting national media exposure uh, but it looked like by 97 the demand and popularity was through the roof so was there anything different about that fourth time around where there was you know a crowd inside and a crowd outside it seemed like everybody just wanted to come to this event that was only about four years old um, <clears throat> it, it really had this kind of organic growth so you went and then if you had a good time you brought you know, some of your friends or you didn't have a good time and you told people not to go, but uh, (laughs) it it really exploded that year. Um, I think the other thing we learned was, you know, we were probably really underpriced and just like with a restaurant, if I were like, you know, if if I go to a bar, it's unusual that if I went to the same bar and the drinks were really cheap, I would pull the owner aside and say, you don't charge enough for your drinks. (laughs) So nobody was telling us we Mm -hmm. we weren't charging enough for our tickets. 
So then all of a sudden, um, the story goes, there's a, a crowd of, you know, 3,000 outside, maybe 11,000 inside. Were, were you going for that record again, or were you just kind of no, seeing no. what happened? Um, we were never going for the record, and, mm-hmm. and, and I'm not even sure if, if I could go back that there was really 13,000 people there in 1979, although that's the story, so I'm going to go with it. But you know, we, with 11,000 people, the lines for the bathroom were an hour and a half. Yeah. So if they had thirteen thousand people, I don't know where they were. You know, I don't know how you could have fit thirteen thousand people in that building. Because you know they didn't bring in bathrooms back then. No, they didn't. So yeah, that's a, it's a tough sell. So we we just it just happened, and it really you know we didn't sell tickets online, and there was a lot of tickets to sales at the door, and uh, most of them were three days before. So people said, you know, why didn't you plan? Well, uh, the reality is that you know we had four thousand tickets sold five days before the event. And then you so nearly, to go from you know, from that to thirteenth, you know, eleven thousand at the time, uh, it, we uh, there was no way to plan for that. No, absolutely not. And, happy problems, but yeah, mm-hmm. it's a good problem to have. I think that would be the motivation to keep going, along with uh, you know raising tens of thousands of dollars on your way to uh, hundreds of thousands, if not a million. So uh, we're going to hear a little bit more about getting to that million dollar mark right after this. The good folks at Brew Bus Buffalo are proud to sponsor the podcast again. That's an all-inclusive VIP beer tasting experience located right here in Western New York. And Bill, you know it. I'm here to ask you, what makes Brew Bus Buffalo a unique experience? Well, um, anytime you take a tour of Brew Bus Buffalo, uh, like you said, it's all-inclusive. But that also includes some special experiences, some behind-the-scenes stuff that you can't get if you just walk into these breweries. Oh, yeah, meeting the uh, brewery uh, owners, sometimes the head brewers. I know, it's a, it's a really good time. Anything uh, special you guys do uh, at different times of the year? We Oh, I'm glad you asked that. We are going to start doing, uh, we're going to do some themes. So, you know, we've been, we've been pretty standard with our tours, and it's been an afternoon Saturday, and then, you know, we do private events as well. But I think we're going to start looking into... Like, you know, maybe a St. Patrick's Day one, uh, the Santa, Santa Con. Maybe we get everyone on the bus dressed up as Santa. And How about a disco theme? We can do a disco theme <laughs> one, too. Like, we're all going to these events anyway. A lot of people take limos. Why not turn your trip into a memorable experience by we'll take you to a brewery all, de- all decked out. We'll start the, the journey there, and then we'll take you to the actual festival or wherever you're going and drop you off, and, and that way you're, uh, you're ready to go. And it's that VIP treatment, Bill, that people get the professional driver, special experiences that we talked about before. Um, all your tastings are included. Mm-hmm. I really feel like uh, that makes this experience top notch. So if you're visiting the Buffalo area or Niagara Falls, check out Brew Bus Buffalo. And our listeners get $5 off when you book through their website, brewbusbuffalo.com. It's promo code BEER5. That's B-E-E-R, the number five, to save $5 off your VIP brewery tour with Brew Bus Buffalo. All right, back to our interview with Dave. So before the break, uh, we mentioned that reaching the $1 million mark and uh, money to charity. Like, was that... How how soon into that did you know like that was that a goal of yours was it a uh, was it just kind of like oh my gosh we might hit a million this year how did how did that go with with you in your head and uh, and how important was it to to actually reach that milestone you know it was never a goal that we set it was something we achieved but it wasn't that really wasn't what we did and, and I, the event even from the beginning although I think some would disagree but has never been about how much money we raised because in Buffalo if that's what you do. If you're just trying to eke every single nickel out of the event, then it just won't have a long shelf life. I mean, there's not many events in town that have lasted 25 years. Mm -hmm. And part of it is, you know, people get bored with whatever you do. I mean, even, you know, we have a theme. You know what it's like trying to explain this to other people, like people out of town? Yeah. Well, you have a disco party? Like, seriously? (laughs) Like, who goes? You and your family? So (laughs) it, it doesn't have a lot of credibility. Um, So the number really wasn't, we wanted to have a really good event, and then we thought that if it was a really good event that people would, you know, and and that was really the other main reason why I started my own charity was I knew what, when I was at Syracuse University, there was a fraternity that used to throw the dance marathon, and they started it, and it was the the second largest dance marathon in the country, and they were raising $100,000 back in the early 80s, which is a lot of money. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
And I was at a meeting one time uh, when I was a junior in college, and I watched, and I, I forgot which charity that it benefited at the time, but the charity was telling these guys, they became like, okay, I want to do these five things. And it was like, no, 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 no. Now, the, it had gone on seven or eight years, and I never wanted to be in a position where someone was going to tell me no. So if I have my own party, and I take all the risk, mm -hmm. so I'm never putting the charity at, at risk, then no one can tell me no. And if I make a mistake, it's going to be my mistake. And if I lose money, it's going to be my money. So I liked having that kind of control. And uh, and then we and then we you know we trademarked the name so no one could use it because it was probably five years into it. And all of a sudden, I hear commercials on the radio. I'd see it in ads. Um, Canal Fest was running a world's largest disco night, and I'm like, okay. And and I said, you know what? What potentially, if they do a poor job, it's going to reflect it poorly on me. On yeah. and I, I don't mind being responsible for bad things I do. I just don't want to be responsible for bad things you do. Yeah, no, it makes sense. No, it's a good lesson to learn too, because you're throwing this once a year. A lot of efforts going into it, so you might as well, you know, take ownership of it. Um, I think right around the time that year you were hitting the million dollar mark, um, we had a celebrity guest on on the way, um, Eric Estrada, Frank from Chips, and I read that it was a last minute cancellation. So I don't know if you could talk a little bit about that. Did the crowd know he was supposed to be there, or was it, was that you're on your way to a million dollars, you know, and hitting that hitting that mark? The party's been going on for a long time, but um, you know uh, what happened. So he was signed for months, and uh, and every one of our contracts, or every contract they have, they put it in. We don't. It it basically says if they get an offer for a TV show or a movie or something basically significantly more uh, uh, financially endearing for them, they can opt out of our contract. And this, everything is pretty much better because they, they give us really discounted rates to come do this. And, mm -hmm. So there was a TV show on CBS that they were coming out with called Armed and Dangerous, and where they were making citizens into policemen. And he got cast in that, and what he got paid was you know, an incredible amount of money. And, but it started filming on Monday, and he said, I, I can't do it. So at that point, we had to, and we only had one guest, celebrity guest in those days. So we had to send a, an email out to our entire list and say, hey, he's not coming. And uh, but we replaced him with Danny Bonaducci, who we we got at the last minute, who was on VH1 at the time and had a, a show called Breaking Bonaducci. So he was actually more popular than Eric was. So we sent out an email to all these people, have to put it in the paper, and and we we, we offer everyone a refund, and we refunded one ticket. One. <laughs> That's awesome. So the next year, I was thought, it Eric's? <laughs> yeah, right. yeah, yeah. So the next year, I thought, you know what, I'm going to go on sale with this thing, without mentioning who the celebrity is because i'm not sure how significant it is it's neat and it's you know it's kind of you know, people say mm -hmm. oh, who was there well this guy was there this guy saw so and so but i don't i don't think that was the driving factor as to why people came i think people come because it's a fun experience so it starts with when i go shopping for clothes with my friends and you're at you know you're, you're trying on stuff at amvets and they're yeah. laughing at each other going you know and then you bring them home and your parents say oh my god i used to wear that or they go into their grandfather's closet who never got rid of any clothes and those are like gold mines for people mm -hmm. um so it, it's it's the whole experience uh so that's how that happened you can find out who the guest is the day before at the sabers game normally i i've seen those pictures mm -hmm. where they're up in the box yeah, and they're yeah, waving yeah. and so that's one way to find out but it sounded like that was uh almost a blessing in disguise you, you learn that you could have surprise celebrity guests and it would be just as successful and popular um i'm wondering that that night, if, if it is that night, is there a, uh, a volunteers or friends and family after party where you guys just breathe that sigh of relief? We pulled it off. We hit the million dollar mark. Uh, we had an amazing guest. Um, you know, job well done. Or do you guys just go home and go to sleep? <laughs> um, we, we generally like to go out, but I, I'm uh, short lived. It's, it's, it's an exhausting day. Mm -hmm. I give the guys at the convention a lot of credit. When you're walking on a concrete floor for three days, I don't know how they do it every day. And your body just, my body aches for a week. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I understand. I mean, 11 o'clock and four o'clock in the morning are two different times and the party yeah. doesn't stop t for the VIP party, at least until yeah, we don't get know. out last year. I think we got out of the building at three thirty, and, you know, we were there at seven o'clock in the morning that day and we've been there for a week very mm -hmm. early. So we've been out pretty late. We've been We've done that. We've I, done quite a few. We we've have. been out often afterwards. We, we, always, we always have so a good time. Adrenaline. Yeah, but now it's a, it's. A, I'm like, you know what? The, you know the the party upstairs keeps going. You can go to the party downstairs if you have those tickets, and uh, and then just go home, go to sleep, rest are you, up. Are you gonna tell Dave about your pants? 
Oh, I did split my pants once. Nice. Um, it was my first year there. I, of course, like you said, you go to Amvets, you go to Goodwill, and I find these amazing pants. And uh, they are just so tight that um, I think they're the style. And we had VIP tickets. And I was just dancing, and we started to have a contest where we would pick my wife up and sort of like put her on her shoulder and spin her around. We were just having the time of our life. And Bill picks her up, and I'm like, yeah, Bill. And then I go to pick her up, and um, I sort of sort of drop her for a second, but I stumble, and I regain my composure, and I, I squat down real low to pick her up and hold her in the air, and my pants split. And I was just like, Bill, my pants split. And he's like, what do you mean your pants split? And he's like, all right, follow me. Now, he had been there before. And it, uh, in the in the bathrooms in the VIP section, they actually have like a first aid emergency kit, oh, yeah? and I think there's everything from mints to safety pins. Yes. And so you had two grown men. One was just standing there, kind of like <laughs> um, like he's being arrested, you know, yeah, like yeah. A, spread spread up against the wall. And the other guy was just pinning them up. So that was uh, I learned my lesson. Never wore those <laughs> pants again. And now I have very loose fitting, uh-huh. flexible clothes. So I learned my lesson too. Make sure you have loose fitting. <laughs> I had to pin. I had to pin those. I'm together. glad you brought that up. I, for, I forgot about that. Oh, I'll never forget about it. Oh, uh, well, how could you? How could you? Quite a view. <laughs> well, Dave, at this portion in the interview, we always like to ask about hurdles you've experienced. I know you guys have everything from a separate VIP party now. Um, you know, ticket sales, like you mentioned, went from you know being maybe physical to online. Anything come to mind about an obstacle you guys overcame the past few years? Yeah, I think the, the first one was probably ticketing um, because, you know, we would print hard tickets We'd sell them at Anderson's locations, and uh, you know, one store would have none, and the other store would have 300. And I'd be running tickets on a, you know, someone could find me to, you know, the week before or two weeks before, and running from one store to the other. So that was uh, going to Ticketmaster. uh, That was probably the best decision we ever made, because I physically would be responsible and handle all 11,000 of those tickets in some fashion. And uh, you know, then occasionally. You know, we would be in an outlet, and you know they would lose the tickets, uh, so that was a challenge. So that was that was pretty bad. But that that changed the list. And plus, when we went with Ticketmaster, and you buy a ticket online, we know who you are. So before, when you were just going up to you know any outlet, and you buy a ticket, you, know, you give them cash, they give you your ticket, and you're gone. So mm-hmm. I don't know who that person is. So I have to spend a tremendous amount of money on advertising to try to f- capture who that person is. Um, so we've done a bunch of things, and you know we've built our list, and it's pretty good today. Um, go back to what I mentioned earlier about um, the pricing. I mean, you know, we were doing a lot of work, and we really weren't making a significant amount of money for charity. So when you have you know uh, ten thousand people in an event, and you're you're writing a check for fifty thousand dollars, the risk reward really wasn't that great. So. Uh, and I had heard in one year we saw 90 tickets, uh, uh, I'm sorry, we saw 200 tickets sell for $90 on eBay mm-hmm. for our event. We were charging $25. So, wow. you know, okay. those people had no risk at all and only a reward. So, and, and I, you know, I always thought we were underpriced. So what we did was we, uh, we adopted what Cy and Marcy Sims did. Unfortunately, they went, they went under too, but, uh, you know, basically in the old sim stores, you would have a suit, and uh, it would roll out at 250 bucks. If you really wanted it, when you saw it, you'd you'd go buy it for 250 bucks. But if you waited two weeks, it became 200 dollars. Then if you waited three weeks, it became 175 dollars. And then after four weeks, they'd blow it out for 150 dollars. Okay. So what we decided to do with ticketing was, well, let's start out at a high price, and then we'll just keep lowering the price as time goes on, and we'll see what happens. So we went from $25 to, we set a ticket price of $50 for the first day of sales. Second day of sales, they were they were 45. The third day was 40. And then we said after that, they would be at $35 for the rest of the sale. So the first day we sold almost all the tickets at $50. At $50, okay. Then we, then we sold a bunch at 45. We sold probably 100 at 40, and then we were done. And then, so we never even got to the $35 mark. And then all of a sudden we had this huge waiting list of people that wanted to buy tickets and because those are the people who were holding out for the $35 tickets. Mm-hmm. And, and we said, okay, the new price is $50. So we went from a $25 ticket price to a $50 ticket price. And that really changed the event because we could afford to buy better things. We could afford to rent better things. So our light got better. Our sound got better. We paid our celebrities more. There's a lot of things that a lot – and our donation doubled. So now we were giving them a hundred or one hundred and fifty thousand dollars, 
and that you know that that that's can that's meaningful to a charity. Not that everything you give isn't meaningful to mm -hmm, a charity. Right. But you can do real things with that kind of money. It's cool that the demand was still there, even though the price doubled. And uh, and I'm sure the demand was there from it. Probably it was the exact same thing for those people that are waiting, like waiting for those 35, waiting for those, and they, and they don't get them. Then they're same thing. They're going to go on eBay. They're going to go find those tickets and probably pay. 60 65 70 up, up to what you said 90 right um so it's you almost created a uh you what you did was it kind of created like we got to get these on the first day because there's mm -hmm. you may not get them on the second right so you almost made more of a urgency um as far as the demand goes as well as um with the price making more money which is kind of cool because the events for charity, any issues with the the, the resale? Um, you know, seeing them online for ninety dollars made you realize let's raise our price. But do you still see that now with them selling out? Uh, you know, people trying to sell them on eBay, StubHub, all that. Yes. Um, today, well, you know, for the last probably seven or eight years, we were only selling out very close to the event, so there wasn't a huge demand. Uh, this year, I can tell you, like a VIP ticket, they still sold out. We sold 100% of the VIP tickets the first day they went on sale in three hours. And the ticket price went up $25. It's an expensive party to throw. Mm -hmm. This party is around $600,000 to put on. So it's it's not cheap. Um, and, it, and unfortunately, it's just an expensive event to put on. Therefore, that's what we have to charge. Right. Um, but the bottom line is, you know, it's an event for charity, and if it doesn't make money, I won't do it. So, and we don't get paid. There's never been anyone that's ever been paid in the history of the event. Um, we've never built, and I have never, and we have never built a lunch, uh, a stamp, uh, gas for my car, mm -hmm. a cell phone bill. None of that stuff gets billed to the charity. Mm -hmm. So, that's great. So, this year, obviously, the 25th anniversary of the event, you've. Uh You've accomplished the raising of over $5 million. Um, what's next? Like, where do you see this event come five years from now? Um, I don't know. We've, uh, um, you know, I, I, I've mentioned that this may be the last year for the event. So, um, and, you know, and basically what I've kind of come to, to terms with is that I will do this as long as people want to come. You know, if this is a big event, you know, but it needs to make money, it needs to make a profit, and we need to be able to do something for charity because mm -hmm. um, it's just too much work to ask everybody for a fun night out. You know, I, I, don't, uh, um, I don't think that I personally have, because people would complain about the cost of it throughout time. And I, you know, finally came to the realization after having a conversation with someone, is, you know, I don't have a social responsibility to put on you know, parties for people. Right. Uh, so there's, you know. If I can do something positive by doing that, then I'm all in. Yeah, that sounds good. Yeah, and is there ever mention of passing the torch to uh, you know someone waiting in the wings to to take that take the wheel and you know, do it for another twenty five? Yeah, um, I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, my my children want me to continue to do it, mm -hmm. and they're in college, so whether or not they they continue to do it or not, um, I'm, I'm not really sure. But uh, yeah, it would be great if it could, if it continued to be fun that we started something. Most of the events that you see, you know, they're for profit events. Yeah. So yeah. They're, that they, they, you know, the, the events that go on even in town are for profit events. So you know, they have a legacy, but someone's getting paid. So um, if that were the case, yeah, I, I, I could do it forever. I guess. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it'd be a nice retirement job. Play yeah. one, one event per That's year. Right. Yeah. Well, we always ask for advice at the end. Any uh, advice for someone or a group looking to start their own event or a charitable fundraiser? Yep. So it's interesting. When you, when you have something that's successful, you, it really can be a self-fulfilling prophecy because people are going to tell you how great it is and I had a great time and, oh, my God, it's amazing and you do a great job. And, and what happens is people get full of themselves and then their event never gets any better because they think it's perfect. Um, the first thing I tell everyone is, when someone comes to me and they say, I go to your event, I've been going for 10 years, the first thing I ask them is, or I, I ask the question, what don't you like about it? I want to know what you don't like. Because I, I know you like it because you're coming back. What I don't know is, and if you stop coming, I, why did you stop coming? People just want to hear good things about themselves so they feel better. But that doesn't make your event effort mm -hmm. better. So I really don't care what you... So we send out a survey at 5 o'clock in the morning. Now, it's, it's more sophisticated now than it was before. And we want your feedback. And the reason we send it out at 5 o'clock in the morning is because if I wait until... I'm not home yet. That's right. That's right. <laughs> there you if, go. I, if I send it out at noon, you know, you will have talked to three of your friends that, went, that you guys went with. And 
now your opinion may be your friend's opinion. Mm -hmm. So at least I get your fresh opinion. Or I get, uh, you know, a hungover opinion. That <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, hopefully they're still it's having the time of their life. Oh, my goodness. I go, well, you've seen me. You've been there. Like when the VIP party grew tremendously, probably six, seven years ago, it opened up the whole bottom. And we used to get there early. We used to stand in line. And I'm telling you, I was like a, I was like a squirrel you let out of a cage that was trapped in a cage for like three or four hours. And I just, I would run in there and I would just start running around like, where should we go? Where, where's the, t where's the best table? Where's the dance? My wife thought I was insane. <laughs> like it, and I'm sure everyone watching me just thought I was insane. Like it's, it is, it is. It was that much fun to. It reminds me of being on a, on a cruise that first day. You're yeah. embarking. You got to go check out this. Okay, we saw that part of it. Let's go over let's to go this bar. Okay, that's great. Let's, let's go this. It's let's that same let's sort of series. energy. So, but I hear what you're saying. If people have some feedback about what they don't like, you could take that and then fix it for next year. Mm -hmm. now, don't just take in all the good. That's uh, that's good advice. Uh, Dave, is there anything that we didn't ask you that you'd like to mention or a story we should tell that uh, might help close this thing out? Um, the one, the the the, um, the ancillary effects of the party have been kind of neat for me too. So pre Uber, so this is probably from 1994 to um, basically maybe, last year. <laughs> yeah, yeah, last right. year is right. Um, there was more limousines rented at the night of the disco than any other night of the year. Um, I just saw an interview on TV. They had someone from DC Theatrics on, which supplies Shays and Studio Arena with all the costumes, and is a major place where people go for Halloween and you name it. And uh, they said, you know, they were interviewing them for Halloween. So this this it has to be your biggest holiday. I said, actually, it's not. It's our number two holiday. The disco is our number one. That's cool. And that was kind of neat. So you know, I, I I got calls from limousine companies that said, hey, you know, thank you very much. Um, we filled up hotels in downtown Buffalo when no one is coming to Buffalo to spend the Saturday of Thanksgiving in a hotel uh, because it's just not a travel town like that. Right. People come home and they stay with their families. Exactly. So it's a little bit different this year um, because the bills are in town so that they will have. But, I mean, John, downtown is jumping and typically it wasn't. And when I, before I started this, we would drive around and, like I said, every place was dark. It was empty. So that's 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 a nice feeling, and the vintage clothing stores and you know places like Amvets can double the price of you know a cheesy polyester uh, you know leisure <laughs> mm -hmm. suit because someone's going to buy it. Yeah, hotels are full, restaurants are full, limos are busy, and yeah. and the Amvets are selling stuff that aren't as difficult to sell. <laughs> Well, it's a nice, of a better it, way to say it. That. Really is. It's it's a nice boom locally, and like you mentioned earlier in the interview, you have people coming from Toronto, maybe friends coming in, like you said, from New York City. And I know that um, if if you can bring somebody to an event, this is like a destination one to definitely yeah. do it for. Well, I think we're ready to close this thing out. One more time, Dave. Where can people go to find out more about uh, you and the world's largest disco online? Yep, it's it's uh, worldslargestdisco.com. Simple. Awesome. Go find it. Yeah. Well, thanks for doing the show. Yeah, thank, thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. It's an honor. Dave Petrowski, Bill. That was fun. That was uh, nice. What? <laughs> I want to go right now. Uh, it's soon. It's really soon. Yeah. It's coming. You ready for year number 20 Year you? number 20. Yeah. Oh, wow. That, those days when Beav used to go and, you know, get the hotel room and he actually rented a leisure suit. I remember that. I think yep. that might have been my first year. That might have been the last time I saw Beef, too. Yeah, might have been. He, I, I think, wonder if he listens to I this. think he's doing okay, though. I hope so, Beef. Well, you know, it's an exciting event, whether you're in town or you're coming into town. Mm -hmm. I know a lot of people travel for the holidays. And if you're looking for something fun to do right around this Thanksgiving time, I don't think there's anything else on the calendar that I know about um, no. nationwide. If you haven't gone, you, uh, I know uh, he's... It's a it's a huge huge deal, and you have to dress up. So don't mm -hmm. do what I did the first year. Go and dress up and really uh, enjoy what you're doing because it it it, it benefits uh, Buffalo, it benefits local charity, and it's a tremendous amount of fun. And it is it, the, the the size of it and the the scale that it's gotten to is amazing. It's it's truly unbelievable, and uh, what a what an amazing story. So, Dave, thank you for sharing. And a reminder to you, the listeners, that if you know somebody fascinating uh, like Dave or somebody just playing with a good story, send it our way on our website, guystellingstories.com. 
we have a suggest a story form, and we love it when people send us suggestions. Mm-hmm. Uh, so check that out online, Bill. They've started to flow in too. That's good. I mean, yeah, it's a lot easier than starting your own podcast and interviewing them. <laughs> yeah, just send us the suggestions. <laughs> so those are, we got a few good episodes lined up for the uh, for the upcoming uh, next few months, and uh, and we'd love a few more suggestions as well. So, and if you're new to the show. Be sure to tap subscribe on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. And, uh, Bill, that's it. I would like to thank some members of my hockey team who have been listening. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, so. you got some uh, shout-outs to give? Thank Go you, ahead. guys. Yeah. Uh, well, they know who they are. Okay. Yeah, yeah well, thank you to uh, the Bill's hockey team and to all of our listeners. It's uh, it's always good to get some feedback, and we'd love to hear from you. So That's it. All right. Disco. As always, I'm Rich Douglas. I'm Bill Easton. Till next time. Disco. Disco.